Good evening, everyone. I'm going to see if I can change the lights, but this might not work. So, is that dim enough? I think that's okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. So, um, I don't need to say anything more. Um, I'm a Chartered Structure Engineer, and I'm going to talk today about uh, a project, a research project that's been going in the UK for the past two years, which is all around minimizing energy in construction. Uh, so this is the first time we've talked about this work on this side of the world. Um, so I'd be really interested to see what you all think about what we've been doing. Um, <coughs> I guess I'll talk for about 45 minutes. And I'll try and keep it short. I think we've got places to go. Um, but I'd give you a bit of the introduction and the context, what MyCon is all about, uh, some results of a survey that we ran uh, quite a long, about two years ago now. Um, and some results from that, and then really just some discussion points, and, and then we can have some questions at the end. So, my research group at Cambridge is about uh, 17 people, and really what we do is look at how uh, structure engineers, designers can address uh, climate change. And COP21, which was a few years ago now, that was kind of the agreement to say, let's limit temperature rise to one and a half degrees centigrade. And in the UK, we have now a net zero target for 2050. So I don't know what the New Zealand target is. Do you have a net zero target? Same? Same target. So this is a big challenge. And what I'm going to do on this slide is just put up a series of um, actions, items that we're thinking about. So obviously climate change is one, population change is another. The UK is very small, but globally we expect maybe 11 billion people on the planet by 2050 and two-thirds of those people will be living in cities. So we have increasing population, increasing urbanization. And the sector that we work in, buildings and construction, is about 40% of energy-related CO2 emissions. So we have a lot of um, these CO2 emissions in our graph, things that we can change. I realize the resolution of that screen is brilliant, but hopefully you can read most of the words. Um, we also work in a huge sector. It's a $10 trillion industry globally. Um, so small changes in cost is big numbers immediately. Uh, in the UK, we have a real drive at the moment to talk about productivity. And so in this uh, graph here with the red and the green lines, you see productivity over time. Manufacturing productivity in that period has nearly doubled. Construction productivity has flatlined. Again, I don't know the um, New Zealand equivalent, but I imagine it would be something similar. Construction sector globally is pretty unproductive uh, uh, industry. Now, the unproductive and very large uh, economic size is important when we look at this pie chart that's just come up. Now, the pie chart comes from looking at where costs go in the UK. This is UK specific, but we looked at um, a large number of projects and costs due to error 21%. So 21% of UK construction is mistakes, basically, which is a huge problem. And you will have seen that on projects. Things get knocked down, rebuilt, put in the wrong place, rebuilt. Errors, and concreting in particular, lots of errors. And then finally, the, the kind of emphasis of my group is to say, well, if we look at whole life energy or whole life carbon, if you went back 30 years then a significant amount of your whole life energy or whole life carbon would come from operational energy. So keeping the lights on, um, air conditioning, etc. With all sorts of things from regulation to decarbonisation of our energy supply, that has now changed. And so we can have buildings with nearly zero operational energy, which means most of the energy and most of the carbon goes into the materials, the embodied carbon. And that's the thing that structure engineers in particular have their hands on or have control over, or some control over, and <clears throat> this is really important because we expect to build in the next 40 years 230 billion square meters of new uh, floor space globally. So that's probably not going to happen in New Zealand, definitely not going to happen in the UK, uh, it's Asia, Africa, South America. 230 billion square meters is Paris every week for 40 years. Okay, so you just have to fly, I've just come from Guangzhou, and you just have to fly anywhere in China to see the scale of construction uh, that's going on. So all those things, you could say, well, that's lots of bad things happening, it's disaster, disaster. I would like to put a positive spin on it and say, all of these things add up to an opportunity to really change how construction is done, 
uh, and deal with all of those issues at the same time if we can. So, just to recap on why it's important for us as engineers, structural engineers, in two case studies, and this is a tall building in London, it's actually the Leaden Tall Building, and this is looking at you know, embodied carbon. Superstructure and substructure is adding up to like 80% of the embodied carbon. So that's really the core structural design stuff that you do. They have a big influence on that. And this second pie chart is an average across a large number of schemes. And you see again, 70% 70, 70 roughly is superstructure, substructure. So chucking those concrete into a building, particularly foundations, particularly tall buildings, has a real impact on the climate. Now, aside from the climate impact, actually you could say, well, if you want to live in Shanghai or Auckland or London, then you need to use materials because we want to go to an office and sit behind a computer all day. And pretty much everything in that photograph has got concrete in it. Um, and so actually there's a kind of a cultural thing to, to deal with there. Assuming we want to keep having cities and metro systems and so on, then really the challenge that we've identified is if you look at real buildings and analyze them for how well they utilize structural materials, and this is just any random building, I'm not picking on this building in particular, you find that 50% material savings are very achievable. Cutting 50% of the concrete, 50% of the steel uh, out, of that, out of your structure is feasible. And if that's possible, then that's a real question of why that practice still exists. Um, and we've seen that in a number of studies with steel structures and with concrete structures. So I think it's something which we uh, really should be challenging. And that 230 billion square meters of new stuff is very likely to be in developments like this. So this is flying out of Cairo. Uh, you see the old sort of development over here and then the very highly planned, very repetitive flat panel, usually flat panel concrete structures. Uh, so building cities for millions of people, you're using lots and lots of material. And so any solution we come up with has to be applicable to all parts of the world. Uh, and it's worth noting that 100 billion square meters of that 230 billion is going to be built in countries without mandatory energy codes at all. So even operational energy isn't being dealt with. So we really have to be thinking very carefully about this. And I think it is important, you know, particularly when I speak in London, we go to you know, Foster's, for example, most of their projects aren't in the UK. Although they're based in the UK, they work all over. Uh, so we're really trying to drive that message. So MICON was a, uh, what we call an energy feasibility study funded by the UK government, es essentially. Um, and we set out a long-term vision, which was to design things cost-effectively using whole life cycle energy consumption minimum material resource for appropriate performance. And then the immediate ambition of you know, the, fir the first two years of the project were to do a series of feasibility studies to look at some of the issues uh, that I've kind of just outlined in the introduction. In that long-term vision, there's a whole lot of big questions like what is cost effective? What's really whole life carbon? What is appropriate performance? And so we're still trying to unpick some of those questions. Um, in the UK, we have, uh, as I said, the net zero target, but we also have some targets for 2025, which uh, is just around the corner, really, in research terms particularly, targeting cost, uh, delivery time, emissions, and export gap. So these are some of the drivers behind uh, the funding that we get as, as, as research and also in industry. And after the Brexit vote, the government had um, a big review of our strategy and the industrial strategy for construction was to focus on digital off-site manufacturing and whole life performance. So these kinds of topics I'm sure are on the radar in New Zealand as well. I just don't know, but I'm sure they are. Um, so I wanted to talk about the survey that we ran because there are some interesting questions. Um, I can't actually remember if anybody from New Zealand filled in the survey. I should have checked before. Well, it was sent all around iStruct T, so it's quite likely that somebody did. I just can't remember. We wanted to examine culture and practice in engineering design as it relates to embodied energy. And you can read the full survey report that we wrote, and there's a journal paper which goes with it. That's all online, download it for free. Um, and so I'm not going to go through all the questions. There were, I think, 36 of them. I'm just going to highlight a few. 
and then as I say, we can discuss. So the first question uh, was what we call a Likert scale question. You get the question and then you get responses from strongly disagree to strongly agree on a one to a seven scale. And so the first few questions will be in this kind of style. So the first question was, maximizing material utilization is a key design criterion for me. So the responses, thankfully, were on the strongly agree and agree side. So 81% of people scoring five, six, or seven. So people agree with this statement. We want to maximize material utilization. Well, I want to. That's an important thing is this question is to me. So it's talking about my own uh, desires. Later on, we said, my clients or design team normally require me to minimize total embodied energy. And now the scale is never to always. And we see that 70% of respondents were scoring on the never or not usually side of that. So your design teams are not asking or requiring embodied energy to be minimized. So you might want to do it yourself, but you're not being asked to do it. We asked if material utilization is presented to clients, so do they know what's going on in their design work? And again, 71% this time say uh, never or not normally or you know, that side of the scale. And finally, you can see where this is going. Clients normally insist on low carbon structural designs and the same, probably the same 70% of people scoring on the never, not usually side of the scale. So I personally want to do it, but in my job, I'm not asked to do it. Not demand, it's not demanded of me. So that gives us an insight that there are other pressures on, uh, on your engineer, your structural designer, over his or her personal desire. We then ask some questions around construction because one of the key pressures or one of the key influences maybe on design is construction. And we said an easily constructed structure is more valued by the whole design team than a materially efficient structure. And now from strongly disagree to strongly agree, so 80% of people saying we agree, strongly agree that ease of construction is much preferred over material efficiency. And that probably won't come as a surprise to you. I just go through one more question. Potential for construction errors influences my member sizing decisions. So the potential for a future error by a contractor who you don't know, who hasn't yet been appointed possibly, is influencing your sizing decisions. 60% of people agree with that. And I simplify my structural designs to improve constructability. Again, 95%. I think this was the strongest response for all the questions. I simplify my designs to improve constructability. That probably doesn't come as a surprise. You know, you're thinking ahead. You know what happens on a site. We just said how unproductive and old-fashioned the sites can be. You change things in design. You use more material as a defensive practice. And yet I showed a pie chart at the beginning that 21% of our costs are due to error. So that strategy of defensive design, trying to make things simple, isn't working, clearly, because we still waste 20% of UK construction costs on redoing things. So I think there's a more fundamental question here that we should be saying, we shouldn't assume that mistakes will happen in construction, we should demand high quality construction. Yeah, that seems a more sensible thing to do to me. And so that's why I have a picture of a robot, uh, not a robot, a factory. This is a Tesla factory. <clears throat> and, you know, a large part of how automotive <coughs> industries, manufacturing have improved their productivity is through this, this type of work. And so part of transforming construction is not just saying we should simplify everything so we, you know, guard against a possible mistake on site, because that clearly isn't working, but that we have uh, a production technology, which probably won't look like this. I'm not suggesting we should build houses in a factory that looks like this. I'm suggesting we should take the principles from automotive aerospace and apply them in construction. And so this project, uh, ACORN, I'm going to come back to in a second, but this is one that's um, just recently started. And ACORN is an acronym. I don't know if the same thing happens in New Zealand, but in Europe, every research grant has an acronym. So ACORN, uh, it's a, a thing that we do. And that's automating concrete construction. And there we're looking at how can you best apply robotics, automation, to help us with using less material and getting rid of error in construction. 
So I'll come back to that in a second. But I just wanted to show some pictures of how concrete structures in particular might change as a result of that. So my work at Cambridge is mostly around concrete, and particularly if you think of concrete geometries, we've got our prismatic column here, can't see any beams, but typically you see prismatic geometries, right? So every cross-section along the length is the same, uh, flat slabs, T-beams, etc. you know, rectangular stuff. And yet we have a material which is uh, potentially made into any shape you like. And so one of the ways we're looking at how you can reduce your concrete consumption is to go from a kind of conventional steel and timber rigid formwork system to one which is flexible and uh, can deform, can be shaped into unusual, unusual geometries and not, not only architecturally interesting but also optimised. So this beam here is a T-beam we made with, with Lafarge some time ago now and the formwork for that is a sheet of fabric and I've just remembered that I carry around the world with me the fabric formwork and so what we're talking about when we say fabric formwork is literally stuff like this so you could imagine casting concrete into this it can take lots of different geometries which a piece of steel or a piece of timber would find uh, both expensive to make uh, and difficult so changing the way we make our structures is a key part of it. Changing the way that we reinforce them. So this picture is some internal reinforcement using carbon fibre, where it's changing in both width and depth according to the requirements of the structural uh, the loading applied to our beam. And that's made on a very simple winding machine where we're placing resin carbon fibre, which is coming off the reel, around the reinforcing cage. Uh, and essentially, if you can code the computer, you can make whatever type of internal reinforcement that you like. So whilst carbon fibre might not be the answer for every particular construction site, it's the ideas behind it, the automation. Why don't we make things in an automated fashion and use these kinds of uh, robotics? Uh, I'm sure universities in New Zealand are doing very similar things. Um, and there's a lot of work going on, particularly in the 3D printing of concrete and extrusion. What we're really thinking about in Cambridge at the moment is how we can use technology which currently kind of already exists in some of our factories and just change it slightly to incorporate this idea around optimization. And so what you have in this sort of um, cartoon strip, if we start at the top left, you have um, a mold where you have a membrane stretched over the top and those vertical lines are actuators which move up and down. So it's a little, little bit like a pin bed that you put your hand into, you know, those things you can imagine makes the, the geometry of your hand. So if you deform the surface, you make the shape of a beam or a facade panel or you know, anything really. You add your reinforcement, you cast over the top, you, you remove it from the mold, scan it to check it's the right shape. And in that process, you can have mass customization because every time you make a new piece, it can be slightly different. You just change the surface a little bit. And the fabric will accept those changes in, uh, in geometry. And so that project, ACORN, is really trying to look at some of the existing automation we have. Um, and so these pictures are just stolen from Google um, when you type in you know, automated concrete construction. And you might have similar things, so it's kind of the, the volumetric construction, the kind of make your bathroom pod or hotel room. Everything here is flat panel concrete. And actually, if you think of most of these structures, there's an awful lot of concrete which is not going to do anything in terms of structural performance, it's just there because it's the easiest way to make stuff. And the picture at the top right, something's clearly gone wrong. I don't actually know what's happened there. Um, but this kind of flat panel con concrete construction is very low efficiency in material use, right? So you're using a very high value, high carbon piece of concrete to sit there forever at a very, very, very low stress. And so I think we're trying to push back against some of these systems and try and say, well, how can we make our structure so that the material is only where it needs to be, to use as much as you need and no more, and perhaps we don't use concrete as an infill material. It's currently very, very cheap and easy to do that, but the carbon implications are huge, huge implications. So if we return to the survey then, uh, what we did as we went through uh, the research uh, responses is we identified a few key questions and I forget how many there were now, there are probably 18 or 19 research questions. 
uh, which we then said, well, we wanted to publish the report, we want other people to help us to answer these. So the first one, in terms of research, was around the incentives of the various groups involved in the building. So architects, clients, engineers, legislators, etc., contractors. At the moment, the incentive of pretty much all those groups is not minimum carbon. You know, that's the incentive of some people, individuals, but not those groups as a whole. And so how do we actually change that? What will be the drivers that could help us to change that? That's the research question. And then there are some industrial questions which we're putting out to industry to say, can we define benchmarks against which we should be comparing designs? How should we present this information to clients and public? Um, and how, well, this is very UK specific, but how might we show that we're demonstrating some kind of progress towards our 2025 targets? And so these questions around benchmarking, about understanding what we're currently doing, uh, are again a bit of a hot topic at the moment, lots of people talking about embodied carbon. Um, and so we talk about things like you know, an energy certificate rating system. Uh, hopefully this exists, I'm sure it does in New Zealand. This is the EU version, you have like an A star, 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 B rating for your appliances, for your you know, washing machine. Why not apply the same to a building so that you can easily see where your design sits within the space of uh, possibility? And most offices have a seven meter grid. You're not the first person to design an office on a seven meter grid, so let's compare between practices and see where good, pra good practice exists. And there's lots of work with IFRP, which I'll touch on in a second, doing that. But then you open all sorts of questions like, what is an A-rated embodied carbon building? How do you present that information to the public, in terms of units at least? Uh, in, at the moment, the public doesn't really care about embodied carbon, I don't think. What might the drivers be? <coughs> in the UK, planning permission is one of the key things. So if you can get planning permission for your new development, then you're onto a winner. Uh, but if there was a requirement in planning permission to show some kind of embodied carbon assessment, that would be a huge uh, step forwards. And then how do we measure it? So what are the boundaries of your whole life carbon assessment? Um, so EN 15978, I realize probably doesn't mean anything, but that's the code in, the, in Europe around whole life carbon assessments of construction works. And A to D is essentially the modules from initial embodied carbon all the way through to the reuse of components. So you can measure all sorts of different levels of detail, from just the total amount of concrete in your building to all the way through to what you do with refurbishment, repair, reuse at the end. But probably the crucial question <laughs> is what is the number, what is the benchmark which allows us to meet those climate commitments? So net zero in the UK by 2050, that means that the whole life carbon of every design by 2050 has to be net zero. You know, we can't have one that's one because then we won't get to target that we need. So it's actually really, really challenging, considering if you type you know, embodied carbon benchmark into Google, you might see people saying a thousand <coughs> kilograms of CO2 per square meter is a target. A thousand is not a target at all. A thousand is easy, right? 400 might be a target, but 400 is still a way away from zero. Yeah, so how on earth do you get to zero? That's the question. And so this is the diagram which you may well have seen. This is the 15978 diagram. You go from the raw materials on the left all the way through to reuse, recycling. And so you can draw your boundaries in lots of different ways. Um, and so we're looking at how you might design those benchmarks, what they might be. And we have some progress from our colleagues in the charter today as well, so RITS, and they have this document, Whole Life Carbon Assessment. And they require their members to do it according to a certain um, uh, code, this code on the right-hand side. And we're trying to encourage, or we are encouraging I-Struct-T to follow suit, essentially. And at the moment, I'm involved with the I-Struct-T Climate Emergency Group, and we are writing the guidance, which hopefully will come out soon. And the reason that it's, I'm kind of banging on about this is that if we all measure in a different way, then you end up with nothing useful. Okay? So if we all measure our embodied carbon in a different way, then we're comparing apples and gorillas, and we don't know what's good. So this diagram here is from an actual database of embodied carbon assessments and you have a range from like 100-ish all the way through to 2,700, which kind of seems fine until you read the small print, which is that they've all been measured in a slightly different way. And so we don't actually know if the 2,700 building is the best one or the worst one 
because if you included all the furniture and the carpets and the lighting and the whiteboards and the computers in one assessment, but in the other assessment only included the concrete, then they wouldn't be comparable anymore. And so this is a really important reason why we need to have a consistent measurement system that we all agree on and we all follow. Actually, the system itself doesn't matter so much. It's just the consistency that's important. So we're looking at how you might see what those pathways for minimum embodied energy are. We're looking at legislation, planning permission in the UK. And we're also looking at the culture. So it's a bit of an unusual project in the sense that actually most of the optimization work, or actually all of the optimization work, all of the design work that we're talking about can be done by a graduate engineer leaving university the first day they leave university. Everybody has the skills to do it. This is not complicated at all. So then there's a cultural question of why don't we do it? Why don't we critically examine our own practice and continually change? And the example that we often use is that of um, accident and emergency or emergency room doctors. So if your patient dies in A&E in the UK, if the patient dies, then the first thing that happens is the team that were there when the patient died immediately debrief, and it's a no-blame culture. So you don't want to blame the nurse for not getting the right syringe or <coughs> taking too long to do something. You want to identify what caused the patient to die and make it not happen again. And we don't have that practice at all. Critical examination of your design is a kind of a, uh, a legal risk, huge risk. People don't want to understand where the bad practice is. And that's completely understandable from things like PI insurance and so on and commercial risk, but it means that we're not really tackling the embodied carbon problem, because we don't really want to. So a key part of talking about risk is related to design conditions. And so we'll talk about loading for a little bit because structural engineers like to talk about loading. We all know what bridge this is, I think, I hope. But the question is, so it's from 1987, 50th anniversary, I think, and uh, the question is, what's the loading on the bridge at this point, do you think? So you can give your units, you give your answer in any units, but have a guess. 2 kPa? Yeah? Any advances on 2 kPa? 3 kPa? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the same person said 3. Right. Oh, sorry, yeah. 3? 6. 6. What is a typical Auckland office designed for vertical loading? Three. Three, okay. Uh, yeah, so it's about, about three. So that's your office loading. So you design your offices for that much people, that many people, I should say. Um, <laughs> this is probably the biggest load that bridge ever, has ever seen. Um, the bridge started to go quite flat under the loading. Um, so this is 60th anniversary, I think. No, 50th anniversary, yeah. So we asked in the survey, some questions about loading. This is just for interest, really. So designing a office building, I think it was, yeah, asking about an office building design. So the characteristic value, and now I realize I should have looked at what design codes are used in, in New Zealand. Does characteristic value mean anything? The yeah, the strength of value. Do you have um, partial factors of design? No. Yeah. Which is strength reduction. Yeah. Instead of dividing by gamma, yeah. we multiply by Okay, yeah. Um, so characteristic value of three, and then we ask, in use, on average, what do you think the store loading will be? So designing for three is fine, but in use, on average, over 60 years, the floor loading in an office can't possibly be 1.5 kPa. Can't possibly. In use, the maximum over 60 years, 2.5 kPa. So these responses show quite a large range as well, which is the graph of the base. So you see the range from zero all the way through to 10 for some of those answers. So how is it that for something as commonly designed as an office, we don't have a good one understanding what the loading actually will be, but also the spread of those responses? That, that doesn't feel like it should happen. So that in-use average of one and a half is six bags of cement per square meter on average. Yeah. But if you think about an office building, for most of their life, they're empty. And so, you know, the one and a half kPa can't really make sense. And so what we have is a strange situation where design codes in, in Europe say, you know, design your office for between two and three. So most people in Europe take two and a half. And then most people in London take five for some unknown reason. 
historic <laughs> practice we just do that. Um, and the, actually the reason is less, eng less engagements. So as soon as one person has a 5 kPa office, everybody else wants one for no reason. Um, but we know that real loading on floors is somewhere between 0.3 and 0.5. And that's been known since 1893. You know, loads and loads of people have done loading surveys. And so we have this strange situation where we're just not really taking the data that we've measured and putting it into design. And that seems like a missed opportunity. So even back in 1925, people were saying, you know, design of live loads has a scant scientific basis. And the British Council for Offices in 2014 saying, design for high, far higher loading than regulations require. That's your London office design for 5 kPa. Because there's a perception in the marketplace that it's a good thing to do. So we allow the perception of a lettings agent and possibly somebody renting an office to govern the design loading you put on your floor. So if you design a floor for 5 kPa, and then that's your unfactored load, you then factor it up and obviously factor down the material system. So the actual collapse load is enormous. You're never going to load it vertically that much. Never. I mean, I would bet money on it. So anyway, so we, um, we then produce a diagram, which is a bit of a um, thought-provoking diagram, and said, imagine you're designing a 30,000 square meter, 16-story building. Let's look at each discipline that might be involved. How many people do they think will be in the building? So the ventilation engineer assumes 10 square meters per person, so 3,000 people. The space planner, you know, for off, uh, desks and so on, 3,700 people. The fire engineer, uh, this is a very rough rule of thumb, so take that with a pinch of salt. Fire engineer, for things like escape routes, might say 7,500 people. Okay, so sizing things for 7,500 people. And then you can see where it's going. The structural design <laughs> is done <laughs> for an order of magnitude more people, 85,000 people. And so it's intended to make you laugh, so that's good. Um, and you can play with the numbers, of course, and you can even go on the Micron website and play with the numbers. There's a calculator on there. But the point is, it's way more than anybody else. And if you tried to load the floor with 85,000 people, they would all suffocate because the ventilation was designed for 3,000 people. So it's just not possible. And even, you know, in most buildings, we have access control. We have pretty good control over what's coming, in, coming and going. So this kind of stuff, we're really kind of trying to challenge and saying, what can we do with our design codes? Because if you try and take it up to the full loading, so that's 5.6, you're really talking about squashing people into a building. And that is not really what happens in reality. So that takes us to thinking about things like measurement and using sensing and data in a, in a more sophisticated way. Um, and so, I'll just put that on there quickly. This is the only maths in the whole presentation. At university, people often get taught about reliability theory and overlap and bell curves, and that's where the you know, percentage chance of exceedance happens. Unfortunately, most of that doesn't really get into a design code. Okay? In, the European, sorry, in the European design code, they very clearly say our partial factors and side factors can be calibrated in two ways. Um, and the first way is on the basis of calibration of a long experience of building condition. And that's the leading principle. So actually what we do is we take our previous design code and calibrate against it instead of using you know, reliability theory, etc. Because it's, it's just what we've done. And the Eurocodes are very open that that is the way that your side factors and your partial safety factors are derived. There's a whole, <coughs> a whole lot more you can look at on the Michael website about those two things. They're just two challenges which exist, I think is the key thing to say. So returning to our survey, um, there are some more questions. You know, what should the real envelope of floor loading, floor loading be? Uh, maybe it should be 3 kPa as a characteristic load. But maybe you think carefully about your serviceability limit states and, and what are the effects of failure um, rather than just taking a large load and assuming it'll be okay. And what might happen if you reduce your partial safety factors? Are there unintended consequences? We talk often about the hidden monsters in those ca calibrated against a long experience of building tradition. It's actually a very sensible thing to do. You know, cathedrals were designed essentially in the same way. When one falls down, you stop doing it like that. You do it like the one that stood up. So that's sensible in many ways. Um, so we need to be careful about changing any of this. 
But what we haven't done in the past is we haven't really measured buildings in any significant way. So we don't really measure loading in buildings. We don't measure structural response. And so we don't really have any understanding of how they really work. Okay? So all of those bell curves and gamma curves and stuff, there's relatively little data around that's actually used now. And so if you started to get into the world of measuring everything in a building, you'd be talking about big data and then how do you extract actual information from that. Because the challenge with putting strain gauges in a building or fiber optics is you're not going to measure very much on average because the building's over designed and the floor loading's not very high. So you're just going to get some small strains. Does that actually really tell you anything that can help you improve design? Um, if anybody's ever done any fiber optic measurement or strain gauge measurement, it's the key thing is being able to extract the insight from all of that. So you can measure stuff, but extracting an insight is important. So I'll just talk <coughs> briefly now about serviceability, because um, we touched on that then. And so question 20 of our survey says, in your experience, how often does SLS govern the size of structural elements? And this one was quite a surprise, because 90% of people saying SLS is governing the sizing of that, their elements. So they're allowing serviceability limit space to govern. And often those service, serviceability limit states are, again, rules of thumb, historic practice, and actually probably could be challenged quite easily. And so particularly things like flat slabs, how flat is your flat slab? And what really should your span of depth, sorry, what should your um, deflection limit be? Uh, you know, if you actually have an office building with a flat slab and let it deflect a little bit more, would anybody even notice? And the whole argument about brittle finishes, well, don't put a brittle finish right underneath the middle of a flat slab then. You know, there are plenty of offices with gaps between the bottom of the flat slab and the top of the uh, partition. That's perfectly easy to do. And if you're allowing it to govern your design, then really think about the loading. Think about what the actual frequent load should be and then do your serviceability limit state design. So we also asked, how frequently would you be comfortable with allowing the SLS to be exceeded? So in a Eurocode design, SLS can't be exceeded. You know, if you have a limit, you can't exceed it. It's a fairly sensible thing to do. But even so, people were happy to allow for deflections, 10% saying the majority of the time I'd be happy for it to exceed the limit. Vibration, a few minutes per day, 28% of people saying they would be happy to let it exceed the limit. Cracking was the only one where most people said never, so 42% saying never allow cracking SLS to be exceeded. So this all goes back to our ideas around measurement and things like traffic lights. So if you were to measure a building and put fiber optics in the floor so you know the floor loading, if at some point the floor is starting to get slightly too loaded, heavy loaded, there's a party going on, why not just have your building management system linked up to a traffic light which says, you know, stop loading that through, redistribute the load. That's what they do on aeroplanes. Okay. Why do we need to design so defensively that we allow any possible use to happen? We can just be a bit more clever with our sensing. And so a very brief case study to show what the possible impact is. This is steel beams. These are real beams in buildings in London provided by a consulting engineer. And what we have is the mass fraction of beams on the, on the vertical axis. So mass of beams in kilogram percentage. And then utilization ratio on the x-axis. So 100% utilization is you know, perfectly safe design um, in Eurocode world. So I hope that is, makes sense. But what you see in this uh, histogram is that most designers work by default to 80% utilization. So in your computer software, you type in 80% of the target utilization ratio. And so there's an obvious question of why not just put in 100%? And then the response is often just in case something changes. And then, okay, so that's fine. But what if nothing has changed? Why did you then go to 100%? Nobody ever does actually do it. Um, so there's very few working at 100%, mostly at 80%. And if we look at what the distribution of governing utilization ratio is, we see 60% of these beams are governed by serviceability limit states. So these are real beams in London offices, 60% being governed by SLS. So there's a question then, could we have structures where we do something clever with the serviceability, and most of the beams are 
governed by ultimate limit states, and most of them are 100% utilization. So that picture is never going to happen because of all sorts of construction problems, I'm sure. But something where we put perhaps 10, 15% of the mass down at the low utilization, because you need trimmer beams, you need stuff which doesn't really do anything, but you need it for ease of erection and so on. You can accept a small percentage down the, up to the left-hand side, but most of it should be up at the right-hand side. So talking about utilization ratios is one important thing to do, but you have to just remember that it's actually the mass, the kilograms of material that's important. And the reason I say that is just as a simple example, you can have an I-beam bending about its minor axis at 100% utilization, which is a silly thing to do. If you just turn it over, it'll be at 20% or something. So we just, there's a slight caveat to talking about utilization, but assuming a competent designer and fairly sensible layouts, then it is a sensible thing to do. And it's fairly easy to look at through whatever computer software you're doing. Uh, using. Um, and then I think the last question is, that I'm going to talk about is asked to design a floor plate in a multi-story building, which is the biggest influence on your final design. And so 30% saying ease of construction, 54% saying cost to climb, and then there are a few others, and around 20% saying material consumption. So cost to climb, I think we can all agree why that's happening. We want to minimize the cost to our client. But then there's a bigger question of who the client really is and should we be saying to structural engineers that the client is, is actually the impact that you have in your design and using more material, and that these things, unfortunately, have lots of other impacts, indirect impacts, from obviously climate, from the CO2, from the production of cement, but also the number of cyclists that get hit by trucks, uh, the traffic fumes, all of that added stuff that comes from having twice as much concrete in your building as you need. And so that absence of sustainable thinking condemns somebody else to pay the price. So there's a very much an externality that we need to address. Um, and so I'll probably finish with these two slides just to say that that's the UN report from, from when was it? Two, two years ago, 2017, yeah, or three years ago. Um, and that pathway, which limits us to one and a half degrees centigrade, gives you a budget of 580 gigatons of CO2 to spend. And so it's actually a pretty quick calculation, which I haven't got with me, but you can do, uh, is if you say buildings, buildings are 40% of that, and you want to build 230 billion square meters of new stuff, that gives you how much carbon you've got to do it. Yeah? And beyond 2050, everything is zero. That's the assumption. So that's a huge change, that pathway. That's a very steep ski slope going down uh, to get to 2050, and then suddenly everything is zero after that. And so how do we achieve that? Perhaps it's changing the geometry of buildings. Perhaps it's changing the way we uh, assemble them. Perhaps it's not using concrete at all. It should be banned cement. Uh, what alternatives exist? Um, those are all things that you can consider. Um, and... I'll just finish with some comments about iStruct-T since I'm here also as uh, a member of iStruct-T Council. Um, so the Americans, in a few years ago, they had the 2050 commitment, which was talking about providing data on designs to a, a database at MIT. And in iStruct-T, we've now been talking about something similar. And earlier in 2019, we had the climate emergency declaration which I'm sure you've seen, so it's structureengineers.com, and there are 129 signatories to this, um, and what they sign up to is those bullet points on the left-hand side, uh, which you can't read, but the important ones are that the signatories to this will seek to share knowledge and research on an open source basis, shift to low body carbon materials, and minimize wasteful use of resources in structural design. There's a few key important things there, which are around sharing knowledge and research. So lots of companies, and I'm sure companies in this room, are starting to develop internal tools around measuring embodied carbon. And so now what we have to do is not just measure internally, but also share that data publicly. And as I said, we're working with the emergency group at iStruct-T to come up with some principles so that we can all put our information into one place. And then you gather more data more quickly to identify what is good practice. Um, 
And the other thing we're trying to do is it's fine to sign up for this, but if your company has signed up, then you must put pressure on anybody who tells you to you know, simplify your design for constructability or make the beam bigger as a, a, a mitigation against possible change. And you have to use this as the reason not to do it. You know, these are companies that signed up, they have to deliver on what they said. And so we've, we're asking people to, to commit to measuring whole life carbon on every project that they do, publicly reporting it, along with its collection method. Um, if you're involved in writing briefs to, in, to ensure that those briefs have whole life carbon metrics and you have some kind of well-measured benchmark, achieving carbon neutral by 2025, companies should measure their own scope three emissions, which is an eye-opening thing to do. Consider if we should have a Hippocratic Oath, which would be first, do no harm, you know, as doctors do. So your patient is the planet. First thing you should do is no harm to it. And how might you do this? <laughs> what steps might you do in a real project? So the obvious way to use less embodied carbon is to not build the building, right? So, and this is actually a really serious point, really serious that if a brief is presented to you and there's an option that you can come up with which delivers what the client actually wants, which can be you know, office space or a hospital, without rebuilding something, then that's a very sensible thing to do. So do nothing sounds flippant, but actually we, what we mean is, based on very deep thinking, structural engineering thinking, um, do nothing. So. Think long and hard to do nothing. That's an important thing to do. So the, an example I'll give you is um, a hospital in the UK. The managers of the hospital think they need two more wards because you know, they've got no space. They've got no space in inverted commas. Uh, the, the engineering firm that was involved, a large firm in the UK, used their uh, team of people who do people flow modeling to take the floor plan of the building and to model the flows of people around it to see how they can better utilize the space and to show that they can get what the client wanted, which is you know, more beds, quicker turnover, without doing anything, without building new buildings, just changing what they already have. Yeah, so that it is possible to do it. Refurbish and reuse and design with reuse in mind. So if you're asked to do a demolition job, then obviously demolishing embodied carbon is a bad thing. Um, can you extend the life of a building? Can you reuse components? Designing with reuse in mind, but not allowing it to govern what you do. Um, choose reasonable loading, specify enough material, and no more. So don't have excess fat. Consider natural materials first. So timber, straw, hemp, etc. <coughs> before, particularly before concrete, steel has a much quicker and more obvious route to zero carbon, because steel can be recycled in a zero carbon fashion. Concrete doesn't because CO2 is released in the manufacture of cement. Concrete is a, is a challenging material. If you're presented with questions around flexibility and adaptability, so, for example, design for 5 kPa just in case something changes in the future, design for 5 kPa because we might want to put a swimming pool on every level of this building in 20 years' time, challenge those statements. And measure real performance. So put sensing in your building, measure what's going on, and use that information to improve your understanding as a result of what you have designed. That's it. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>